above the tempests of our weekdays, across the ashes and cindered homes of the past, before the gate of the vacant future, we proclaim today to you, artists, painters, sculptors, musicians, actors, poets, to you people to whom art is no mere ground for conversation, but the source of real exaltation, our word and deed, the impasse into which art has come to in the last 20 years must be broken. The growth of human knowledge with its powerful penetration into the mysterious laws of the world which started at the dawn of this century. The blossoming of a new culture and a new civilization with their unprecedented in history surge of the masses towards the possession of the riches of nature. A surge which binds the people into one union. And last, not least, the war and the revolution, those purifying torrents of the coming epoch, have made us face the fact of new forms of life, already born and active. What does art carry into this unfolding epoch of human history? Does it possess the means necessary for the construction of the new great style? Or does it suppose that the new epoch may not have a new style? Or does it suppose that the new life can accept a new creation which is constructed on the foundation of the old. In spite of the demand of the Renaissance spirit of our time, art is still nourished by impression, external appearance, and wanders helplessly back and forth from naturalism to symbolism, from romanticism to mysticism. The attempts of the Cubists and the Futurists to lift the visual arts from the bogs of the past have had only to new delusions. Cubism, having started with simplification of the representative technique, ended with its analysis and stuck there. The distracted world of the Cubist, broken in shreds by their logical anarchy, cannot satisfy us who have already accomplished the revolution, who are already constructing and building up anew. One could heed with interest the experiments of the Cubists, but one cannot follow them, being convinced that their experiments are being made on the surface of art and do not touch on the basis of it, seeing plainly that the end results amount to the same old graphic to the same old volume and to the same decorative surface as of old. One could have hailed futurism in its time for the refreshing sweep of its announced revolution in art, for its devastating criticism of the past, as in no other way could one have assailed those artistic barricades of good taste. Powder was needed for that, and a lot of it. But one cannot construct a system of art on one revolutionary phrase alone. One had to examine futurism beneath its appearance to realise that one faced a very ordinary chatterer, a very agile and prevaricating guy, clad in the tatters of worn-out words like patriotism, militarism and contempt for the female, and all the rest of such provincial tags. In the domain of purely pictorial problems, futurism has not gone further than the renovated effort to fix on the canvas a purely optical reflex which has already shown its bankruptcy with the Impressionists. It is obvious now to every one of us that by the simple graphic registration of a row of momentarily arrested movements, one cannot recreate movement itself. It makes one think of the pulse of a dead body. The pompous slogan of speed was played from the hands of the futurists as a great trump we concede 
the seniority of that slogan, and we can quite see how it can sweep the strongest provincials off their feet. But ask any futurist how does he imagine speed, and there will emerge a whole arsenal of frenzied automobiles, rattling railway depots, snarled wires, and the clang and noise and clang of carouselling streets. Does one really need to convince them that all that is not necessary for speed and for its rhythms? Look at a ray of sun, the stillest of the still forces. It speeds more than 300,000 kilometres in a second. Behold our starry firmament. Who hears it? And yet, what are our depots? to those depots of the universe. What are our earthly trains to those hurrying trains of the galaxies? Indeed, the whole futurist noise about speed is too obvious an anecdote, and from the moment that futurism proclaimed that space and time are yesterday's dead, it sunk into the obscurity of abstractions. Neither futurism nor cubism has brought us what our time has expected of them, Besides those two artistic schools, our recent past has had nothing of importance or deserving attention. But life does not wait. And the growth of generations does not stop. And we, who go to relieve those who have passed into history, having in our hands the results of their experiments, with their mistakes and their achievements, after years of experience, equal to centuries, we say we say no new artistic system will withstand the pressure of a growing new culture until the very foundation of art will be erected on the real law of life until all artists say with us all is a fiction only life and its laws are authentic and in life only the active is beautiful and wise, and strong, and right. For life does not know beauty as an aesthetic measure. Efficacious existence is the highest beauty. Life knows neither good nor bad, nor justice as a measure of morals. Need is the highest and most just of all morals. Life does not know rationally abstractive truths as a measure of cognizance. Deed is the highest and surest of truths. Those are the laws of life. Can art withstand these laws if it's built on empty abstractions? On mirage and fiction? We say space and time are reborn to us today. Space and time are the only forms on which life is built, and hence art must be constructed. States, political and economic systems perish. Ideas crumble under the strain of ages. But life is strong and grows, and time goes on in its real continuity who will show us forms more efficacious than this? Who is the great one who will give us foundations stronger than this? Who is the genius who will tell us a legend more ravishing than the prosaic tale which is called life? The realisation of our perception of the world in the form of space and time, is the only aim of our pictorial and plastic art. In them we do not measure our works with a yardstick of beauty. We do not weigh them with pounds of tenderness and sentiments. The plumb line in our hand, eyes as precise as a ruler, in a spirit as taut as a compass. We construct our works as the universe constructs its own, as an engineer constructs his bridge, as a mathematician his formula of the orbits. 
we know that everything has its own essential image. Chair, table, lamp, telephone, book, house, man. They are all entire worlds with their own rhythms, their own orbits. That is why we, in creating things, take away from them the labels of their owners, all accidental and local, leaving only the reality of the constant rhythms of the forces in them. One. Thence, in painting, we renounce colour as a pictorial element. Colour is the idealised optical surface of objects, an exterior and superficial impression of them. Colour is accidental and has nothing in common with the innermost essence of a thing. We affirm that the tone of a substance, that is, its light-absorbing material body, is its only pictorial reality. Two. We renounce in a lie its descriptive value. In real life, there are no descriptive lines. Description is an accidental trace of a man on things. It is not bound up with the essential life and constant structure of the body. Descriptiveness is an element of graphic illustration and decoration. We affirm the line only as a direction of the static forces in their rhythms in the objects. 3. We renounce volume as a pictorial and plastic form of space. One cannot measure space in volumes as one cannot measure liquid in yards. Look at our space. What is it if not one continuous depth? We affirm depth as the only pictorial and plastic form of space. 4. We renounce in sculpture the mass as a sculptural element. It is known to every engineer that the static forces of a solid body and its material strength do not depend on the quantity of the mass. Example, a rail, a T-beam, etc. But you sculptors of all shades and directions, you still adhere to the age-old prejudice that you cannot free volume of mass. Here we take four planes and reconstruct them with the same volume as four tons of mass. And thus we bring back to sculpture the line as a direction, and in it we affirm depth as the one form of space. Five. We renounce the thousand-year-old delusion in art that held the static rhythms as the only element of the plastic and pictorial arts. We affirm in these arts a new element, the kinetic rhythms as the basic form of our perception of real time. These are the five fundamental principles of our work and our constructive technique. Today, we proclaim our word to you people. In our squares and on our streets, we are placing our work convinced that art must not remain a sanctuary for the idle, a consolidation for the weary and a justification for the lazy. Art should attend us everywhere that life flows and acts. At the bench, at the table, at work, at rest, at play, on working days and holidays, at home and on the road, in order that the flame to live shall not extinguish in mankind. We do not look for justification, neither in the past nor in the future. Nobody can tell us what the future is and with what utensils does one eat it. Not to lie about the future is impossible and one can lie about it at will. We assert 
that shouts about the future are for us the same as the tears about the past. A renovated daydream of the Romantics. A monkish delirium of the heavenly kingdom of the old attired in contemporary clothes. He who is busy today with the morrow is busy doing nothing. And he who tomorrow will bring us nothing of what he has done today is of no use for the future. Today is the deed. We will account for it tomorrow. The past we are leaving behind as a carrion. The future we leave to the fortune teller. We take, we take, we take, we take, take the present day. day.